What does it mean to be called crazy in a crazy world? Listen to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Sponsored by peer-run support communities, Freedom Center, The Icarus Project, and Portland Hearing Voices. Madness Radio can be heard on FM stations on the Pacifica Radio Network and is online at kboo.fm slash madnessradio. Thanks for tuning in to Madness Radio. This is your host, Will Hall. Today, my guest is Anasuya Starbear. Anasuya is a therapist in private practice, and she's also a leadership coach. She has degrees in process-oriented psychology and conflict communication. Uh, she's a longtime practitioner of Cherokee Indian mindfulness practices and is a voice here. Uh, she's a survivor of a head injury and someone who struggles with long-term chronic pain and also experiences altered and extreme states. So we're going to be speaking with Anasuya about her experiences and also her work as a therapist and healer. So welcome to Madness Radio, Anasuya Starbear. Hi, Will. It's so nice to be here with you. Yeah, I'm really happy to have you on the show. I've been wanting to do a show um, about the relationship between altered states and chronic pain for a long time. And you're someone who's a survivor of a head injury, and we're going to be hearing about that. And you've taken your experience both as someone who's had a near-death experience, who has altered and extreme states, and also hears voices. And you've really fashioned this into a very unique way of working with clients. And so I'm very inspired by your work. And also we're going to be hearing about the role that art plays in your healing practice as well. And I'm really happy to have you on the show. And maybe we should just begin. To, I mean, you have an incredible story of surviving um, a near-death experience and your own experiences with voices in altered states. Just give us a sense of what you've come through that that's brought you to where you are today. My earliest childhood memory is really one of an extreme state. Uh, and it was very pleasant where I would I would leave my body uh, after my mom put me to bed in my crib I would let myself just sort of float out of my body and I identified with being particles of light and I would spend the night in the sky with the stars and the light and that's my my earliest memory that that would happen over and over again I would feel like my body was a little too small, my skin was a little too tight to hold me, and so I would get free for the night. Then when I was three or four years old, I had an experience that's my first memory of realizing that I needed to marginalize or not talk about those kind of experiences where I left my body. My grandma had come to visit from far away, and I was very excited, and the family was on the way out the door of the house to the car to go on some outing with her. And you know, like kids will do, I I was just so excited I had to run. And I decided to run to the car and be the first one to touch the door handle on the car. And I was so little, I remember having to reach way up to reach that car handle. When I touched it, I looked at it, and the sun was reflecting in the chrome of the handle. And instantly then... The next thing I knew, I had become the sun. I was just light, and I was radiating light, and I was way up in the sky, and I was so happy. I was just elated, joyful, very similar to the experiences I would have as a baby when I would go into the night sky. I, it seemed like I did that for a very long time, like that's just who I was. And then the next thing I knew, I was sitting in a car wedged between a bunch of adults in the back seat, and it was a bit shocking to be in my body again and I was trying to reorient and people were talking and I realized they were talking to me and they expected a response and I panicked because I didn't know the language. It sounded like, you know, it didn't make any sense and part of that might have been because I was very young and I probably didn't have a huge grasp of the language but also I think it was just trying to transition from being the sun to being a human being and I remember this like it was yesterday the whole experience and I suddenly became very sad I realized they don't know where I've been they don't know that I was the sun and how wonderful it was and I can't tell them because people don't talk about those things well, I want to thank you for talking about this with us today, and it really sounds like your own experiences of altered states and these visionary experiences go right back all the way deep into the core of who you are as a person living on planet Earth. 
I, for most of my life and, and still off and on, experience an incredible sense of isolation and loneliness because I have these experiences which do feel like the core of who I am and they're very meaningful for me and there are very few people that would be open to hearing about it, let alone happy to hear about it. <laughs> so that's isolating. Were you ever worried that maybe you were crazy or that something was wrong with you for having these states? You know, I am so lucky in that. For some reason, I escaped that whole pathology part of it. I have just always felt, actually, that those experiences I have are more real to me than the being in a human body experience. And I've never doubted them. I've treasured them. And it's just been sad for me that people don't talk about these things. I don't think I'm the only one that has this particular flavor of experience, and I know that people have all kinds of flavors of states that aren't what we call normal reality. Because these are altered states and they're, they're extreme because you really are losing touch with reality, or at least this reality, but they're not painful experiences. They were, sound very ecstatic, the two experiences that you described. Yeah, I have recently, like in the last three years, had an experience which was very difficult for me to integrate. It was so strong that it was very difficult for me to integrate into my everyday life. And I guess we could talk a little bit more about that when we talk later about how I work with people professionally, because I think that the hardest thing for me about these states is that they're very different than our everyday reality state of mind. And what do you do with that? What are some yeah. of the other states that you grew up with, you know, the other experiences that you had and maybe continue to have? One, which is also part of my earliest childhood memories, is going outside alone in nature uh, wherever we lived, I would seem to find the little wild spot, even if it was in suburbia, and actually becoming one with the rocks or the grass or the sky or the birds, a feeling like I did leave my body, my identity with being human, and became a tree and felt my roots growing through the earth or um, became a rock and had sat there for ages and soaking up the sun. In my teenage years, I did experiment with psychedelics a little bit, and I can say that there was, there was nothing I experienced when I was uh, stoned on peyote or acid that I hadn't already experienced. It's just my way of understanding the world, I guess. And so those drug experiences really just gave you access to something that was already inside you, it sounds like. Well, what I learned from the drug experiences was, actually, it, that was interesting. I haven't really thought about this, but I didn't do it very much, and I did it always as a, as a spiritual seeking out in nature alone. And really, that was the point in time I was young. I was like 12. And I realized that there's nothing in a chemical or in a pill or in anything outside of myself that would cause me to have an experience, that the experience is already inside of me and that substance just opens the door so that I can walk into that space. And so from taking the drugs, I learned how to, at will, walk into these altered states, not just have them happen to me. And I had done that all my life off and on, but not so consciously. I would put myself in a situation in nature or whatever and then just morph into the landscape. But I realized that at 12 years old that I had a choice of what state I wanted to go into. Now that's not saying that I always have choices. I get in moods and, you know, have all kinds of experiences that I don't feel much in control of. But I am lucky that my altered states are usually very pleasant and I don't feel out of control. I have had some what you would call extreme states where I do completely lose identification with Anasuya Star Bear. And the one that I alluded to earlier was I think the only thing that's happened to me in the altered extreme state realm that was scary. So it sounds like you learned something very early with the experience with the car that, that there's a time and place and you have to be careful about who you talk about these experiences with and be aware of how they're going to be 
received, and you've described it before as you were living kind of a secret life. Is that right? Yeah, it was precious, these, these experiences, and it was lonely. There was a split between my family life or my friends and I, my school life, whatever. There was a split between that and what I experienced as, I guess for lack of a better term, my spiritual life, my deepest, most meaningful experiences. And were these experiences what led you to start on a spiritual path and develop a spiritual practice? Yes, and I tried many different spiritual paths when I was younger and learned something from each one. Yeah, I was very interested in alternate realities. When I was about eight years old, I guess, I was in, I was in first or second grade, so probably second grade. My desire to learn more about these places that I went to was so strong and to find some kind of a validation or a mentorship on the outside for that uh, on the outside in the you know everyday world and so somehow or other I, I heard of church my dad was an atheist and my mom had been brought up Catholic and as a teenager had decided that that wasn't for her and had never really found anything else although she she had wanted to, but she'd never really actively explored it. And so as a kid, I didn't have any exposure to religion. But there was a church about three blocks away from our house. And I guess at school, I heard of some people going to church or something. So I became curious about that. And I asked my mom if we could go. And she said, no, she wasn't into that. So my birthday rolled around. And the one thing I asked for was a Bible. And I remember my mom just wondered where I got that idea, but she bought it for me. I still have it today. And then I decided I wanted to go to church because I sensed that the people in the Bible were having altered state experiences and they were in nature, like the ones I was having in terms of deeply meaningful. And when I had these altered state experiences, I feel like I'm connected with everything. I'm one. Mm. I'm just life force. So anyway, I ended up, I started going to church, which was really funny because my family slept in in the morning, which I love to do too. But I would get up early and I'd walk to church and I joined the choir and I did the fundraising things. There's this little kid going to church. And so anyway, I, I found some things from that and not everything. And so later, you know, my course through life, I... I investigated many forms of Christianity, Eastern religions, Buddhism, and then ended up with Cherokee wisdom holder, Cherokee elder. Tell us about that. How did you find that person and what did you learn from that and what was it like? What was being involved with that like? I had been studying with a yogi and, and learning many things and feeling like a lot of it was cultural that was not part of my culture. And so I really yearned for a teacher in the flesh who who belonged sort of to the same culture as me, I guess I would say. I wanted it to feel more of an everyday sort of practice. And for years I'd been doing yoga practices and yoga meditation. So I started having dreams at night that there was this Native American woman who was dancing with me in the stars. Now I have had repeated dreams through my life that I am made out of light and I'm like a, a swirling enormous cloud of light particles and I birth galaxies out of the center and it's just this yummy Wonderful. kind of dream. Wonderful. Yeah, so I was having some dreams like that but she was there with me, this Native American elder and we were dancing energy spirals in the stars together and she was teaching me things and I heard her voice teaching me and it was a different voice than one I'd heard since I was little. And I wondered if it was my great grandma who was Cherokee and died before I was born. So she was teaching me amazing things. I'd wake up in the morning and write them down and they were very profound in terms of what I was needing to learn in my life. And at the same time, I was just asking the universe, please send me a teacher in the flesh. And um, for some reason, somebody brought me a magazine. It was a yoga journal. I still have the copy. This is 30 years ago. And her picture was on the front, Dahani Yuahu, who became my Cherokee teacher. And I took one look at it, and I knew she was the one who'd been in my dreams. And we lived in a far, on a farm at the time, and I ran with the magazine without opening it. 
out into the apricot orchard and just fell down on the plowed dirt and cried into the dirt and just let the earth hug me and hold me because I felt like I've been given this incredible gift. I, I didn't even know how to say thank you. I just felt so grateful and finally opened it up and, and read the article and was even more inspired that it was right for me. She was in Vermont. I, I tracked down a phone number and it turns out I was living in the Bay Area in California. It turns out she was making her first trip to the West Coast two weeks later to, to do a workshop for the first time on the West Coast and I was able to get into that workshop. And so I still, I, I for 12 years I studied quite intensively with her hours a day of practice and meeting with her several times a year. And now I still do take a couple classes from her every year over the internet or like a Skype thing and I call her for private sessions. So it's very much a part of my life. And Anna Sue, you mentioned hearing voices, and you're someone who's heard a voice for long term. It's a very positive voice. Tell us about your, your experience as a voice hearer. My first memory is very mundane. Again, I think I was three or four years old, and I was walking down a street in a town, which was unusual. My mom had four kids in five and a half years. I was the oldest kid, so she didn't take us all that many places very often. We were too much of a handful. So it was kind of a special day I remember I was out with some grown-ups and again I was really small because I was holding the hand of an adult and I remember my arm was stretched way up in the air to hold that adult's hand and they the adults stopped on the sidewalk I think they're waiting to cross the street or something and I noticed a, a window that was low enough for me to actually see in it was a shop window of an optometrist there were all these pairs of glasses in the window and I just became fascinated with the glasses and I heard a voice say, this was the first time I remember the voice, the voice say, you'll wear glasses in a few years, but only for one year, then you won't wear them till you're a grown up. And I just thought, oh, okay. I just took it for granted. It's like, yeah. And then a couple years later, for one year, I did wear glasses in the fourth grade. And now as an adult, since my head injury, I wear glasses. So oftentimes when I hear the voice, it is prophetic. It tells me something about the future, sometimes rather mundane, like the glasses, and sometimes something that's personally applicable to my own perception of something, you know, that I, it will change my viewpoint on something which will help me deal with something different in the future, a relationship issue, or what path to take in life. Do you identify the gender of the voice? Is it a male voice or a female it's a, voice? It, it's an older woman, and I have also wondered if that's my Cherokee grandma. I don't know who it is. It's just the voice. I call it the voice, and it has never been mean to me, but it is often very stern, and I don't feel that I can go against it because it seems way wiser than I am. So an example of it, it kind of, it takes me over the edge of what I'm comfortable with quite often. And I do argue with it or try to resist it, but it's usually futile. Uh, so an example of that, my last name is Starbear. And I had been having, a few years ago, I'd been having some visions and some really powerful dreams in the daytime uh, that were like visions. I was awake. <laughs> of the giant grizzly bears coming and talking to me and telling me things. And since I was a small child, I've loved grizzly bears. And then I was doing some artwork and these bear paw prints appeared at the end on the artwork. I put them on there, but I didn't know why. I didn't know what they meant. I didn't know anything about this bear wanting to come in somehow. And then I was driving my car in a really intense rainstorm at night so that I was having to focus very diligently on the road and not being able to see that well, this pounding rain on the roof of the car. And I heard the voice say, your name is Star Bear. And it was so funny because I guess I was really focused on the road or it was such a huge edge for me that I thought it was the radio. And I thought, well, that sounds interesting. And I went to turn up the radio and I realized the radio wasn't on. And even if it was, I wouldn't be able to hear it over the pounding rain. And so I was a little curious, but I went back to focusing on the road, and again, your name is Star Bear. And it wouldn't let me quit thinking that it would, every time my thoughts would drift, the voice would come again. 
So finally, you know, I was trying to process this and finally I thought, oh, that must be like my my spiritual name or or the name that my great grandma had. It's my it's my true family name because that was a matriarchal line. So that was her name and we had stayed in that tradition. It would have been my my last name. Anyway, I was wrestling with it this way, trying to make sense of it, and the voice kept saying, No, your name is Starbear and I knew it meant that I had to change my last name to Starbear. And so I started to talk back to the voice, okay, well, that will be in my heart. That will be my last name. <laughs> and the voice, no, no, legally, that's your last name. And I was terrified. I thought, nobody's going to come to me as a therapist with a name like that. It will discredit me. I already feel like I stand out as different in certain situations. That's going to be this label that, you know, people won't be able to relate to me. Anyway, for two years, I wrestled with that idea. And for two years, the voice kept saying, you have to do this. So I did. It took me two years. And it didn't hurt me in any way. And after about a year of adjusting to it, after I changed my name, I felt so much more settled, like a part of my insides had come home. Well, good for you for having the courage to follow that spiritual <laughs> It's guidance. not me. It's not the courage. It's the voice is so persistent. I, I just, <laughs> yeah. And are there other examples of where the voice has given you guidance where it turned out to be really, really wiser than you might have followed yourself? Well, I've learned over the years to also ask the voice when I need help. Uh, so sometimes it comes in unasked, and always if I ask, it does come. And I have a terrible sense of direction, and I get lost easily. So <laughs> very often, at least a couple times a month, I get lost in my car, and I start to panic, and I ask the voice, please, just tell me where to go. And usually it's not telling me anything that I agree with. <laughs> it's like, no, that can't be the way. But if I follow it and I just keep trusting, keep trusting, putting the panic aside, keep trusting, it gets me home every time or where I'm going every time. And often in a, in a very unusual route that I didn't know before. If you're just tuning in, this is Madness Radio. And today the topic is chronic pain and altered and extreme states. And our guest is Anna Suya Starbear. She's a therapist in private practice and also a leadership coach with degrees in process-oriented psychology and conflict communication. Anna Suya is a longtime practitioner of Cherokee Indian mindfulness practices. She's a voice hearer and a survivor of head injury who is living with chronic pain. Anna Suya, you had a near-death experience that led to uh, living with chronic pain and, and a head injury. Do you want to tell us about that? That was in 1982. So uh, much of my adult life has been post brain injury. I, I had a traumatic brain injury. What happened was I was gardening in my backyard and I lived in a neighborhood in a rural area of California where I guess it wasn't unusual for people to have guns because people went hunting. Anyway, I was, I was just transplanting some baby lettuces in my backyard and there was a patio nearby and I was standing up on the patio and someone had either in the house behind us or the house next door. We don't ever know or found out who did this. But somebody shot a gun into the air. I'm sure they thought that was a completely safe thing to do. But what happened is the bullet ricocheted off a tree and came right down to my head and, wow. and went through my head. And so my experience was fascinating. I mean, I had no idea that, that that's what had happened. I, I just experienced um, my body suddenly, everything happened in slow motion. I think my brain was trying so to process so quickly that it seemed like slow motion because my brain process was speeded up. So I, I noticed that my body was starting to fall to the right. And then there was this searing hot fiery pain in a particular part of my head that then spread all through my head and then I heard a sound like I said everything was in slow motion and the sound was like 
And I thought later that that was the sound of my skull cracking because my skull fractured in many places, almost like a spider web. But years later, looking into people who get shot, your brain does speed up so much to try to process it that that was probably the sound of the gun firing. Isn't that amazing? So, yeah, we're, you know, our brain is capable of a lot of things that we don't experience every day. So anyway, then my body started falling the opposite way. I got shot on the left side and now I started falling to the left. It was probably just a small jerk to the right and then I fall to the left. And at that point, I couldn't see and I could feel warm blood just covering my head and my neck and face. And I thought, oh my gosh, I've been hurt really bad. It must have been somebody throwing a big rock. And then I, th I, I continued to fall. It was such slow motion. And then I thought, no, no, it's got to be a hard ball. Like I'm really hurt like those baseball players. You know, this is serious. I have to get help. And then I felt my head hit the concrete. And I felt myself bounce again in oh. slow. And then suddenly I was shooting backwards, head first, at this incredible speed through this dark, dark, pretty narrow tunnel. And it seems like I was in that tunnel for a long time, like shooting upward like a rocket. And suddenly I came into this place that was all light. It was this golden, shimmering light, almost like the most beautiful golden sunset you've ever seen. And the light was not only light, it was vibration and it was sound and it was this beautiful, beautiful, melodious sound, like a harmonious sound that was a combination of every note that there is. And it was just beautiful. And I remember it was so funny because I had my thinking process was definitely there because I remember thinking, oh, I'm home, I'm home. And uh, I just started to relax and melt like in my other altered states or my extreme state started to melt into the particles of light and just become one with it. And then I heard a voice and it wasn't the usual voice. It was a, a very loving, deep man's voice. And it said, you're not done yet. And then I had this sense. It was funny because I didn't have a sense of having a body, but I had more of an awareness. And my awareness turned to the left and down and I could see that tunnel that dark tunnel, and at the end of the tunnel, the other opening opposite to where I was looking, like looking through a periscope or something, there was the earth, like the whole globe of the earth like you would see from space. Then I remembered that on the earth I had two young children who I was very much in love with and very dedicated to mothering. And I thought, ah, I'm not done yet. I have to be there for them. And then the next thing I knew, I was in the tunnel and I was using superhuman willpower. I saw such incredible will to get a sound to come out of my mouth, to call to my husband, the father of my children, whose name was Lenny. And I forced the sound out and I watched it in slow motion bounce and echo off the sides of the tunnel. And I willed it to go out that opening, which was seeming to get smaller. And I knew if that opening closed that I could see the earth through, that I wouldn't be able to get back anymore. And so when I managed to say Lenny, it sounded like Lenny, you know, it was just bouncing away from me. And I was willing it to go out that hole. And as soon as it got out the hole, I could feel Lenny picking my body up and running with me. I couldn't see. The shot had damaged the optic nerve. I couldn't see for a few weeks. And, and I heard him shout, help me, someone's shot my wife. And, and I thought, oh my God, I've been shot. I'm going to die. I've been shot in the head. I could feel the blood all over me. People don't live through this. And then again, I thought, no, I'm not going to die. I'm not done yet. I didn't remember the experience in the tunnel at that moment, but I had the same decision, made the same decision to live. Wow, what an extraordinary story. And then you were taken to the hospital and then... And then um... I was, and the, the, yeah, there was a whole procedure from there and I was in a coma for a while. They, they thought the bullet was stuck in my brain and they had to do foreign body scan and all these things and it, it wasn't. It had actually gone in one side and come out the other across the top of my head. And my husband was a nurse and so... 
He had been a medic, a corpsman in the Navy, and so they allowed me to come home and he would track my vital signs and things. And that that was a long process of healing. What happened during the time that I was in the coma is I had a memory of what I can only call another life, where I had suffered a lot and decided to commit suicide. So after I came out of the coma, I had a hard time deciding which world was real. The one I was in that was the story of the other life, or this one, or the one where I went into the light. And that one just kept calling me as the most real and the most wonderful. And I was in a lot of pain physically. When you were in the coma, you, you actually had a memory, but it was a memory of another incarnation or another life where you had actually committed suicide, but it wasn't in this reality, it was in some other some kind of parallel reality. So you're dealing with multiple worlds, the being there at home recovering from being shot in, in the head and almost dying, the state of going and joining the light, and then this memory of being another person who died by suicide. Wow. It was intense, yeah. How did you recover from all that? And, and apparently this is something that led to a long-term chronic pain that you're still living with. Yeah, it was about a year before I... I made a commitment fully to stay here, to stay in this body, to stay in this life, regardless of the pain. And there was a time in there where I tried to commit suicide, to go home to the light. I talked my husband into driving me to a beach which was known for sharks in that time of year at sunset, which is the time of day that has that kind of golden light. It's always been my favorite time of day, sunset over the ocean. And I wore heavy clothing and heavy shoes so that I knew, even though I'm a good swimmer, if I swam out as far as I could, even if I changed my mind, I probably couldn't take it back, you know, make it back. And so it was a really intense time, Will, because actually the thing that I haven't mentioned is when I got shot, I'd only been out of bed for two weeks. I'd been in bed for for a pregnancy and my third month of the pregnancy my water broke and I started having a lot of problems and had to stay in bed for the duration of the pregnancy and then my third son he uh, was born at home like my others but there were complications and he only lived for three days and then my health was quite poor from all of that so I ended up being in bed for about another six weeks after my third son died and when I got shot it was my first day into the garden after all of that I'd, I'd only been out of bed about a week so I so all of that just drove you to saying wow I'm I'm out of here I'm it's too go it's into, too hard here too and hard, I have yeah. a yeah and I have a baby on the other side that uh, I could go home to and the golden light is there and I was convinced that I wouldn't be able to be the kind of mother I wanted to be to my two sons who were here and that they'd be better off without me. I was in such a state. And then what happened when you, you actually went out and swam out into the I did. I was, I was wow. about, yeah, I talked my husband into dropping me off and going and doing the grocery shopping or whatever. And he had a funny feeling. And so he started driving away and then he felt compelled to come back but I think he didn't want to infringe on my privacy he knew I was grieving intensely and that I loved the ocean and the sunset so he parked down a ways and walked up the beach around you know a little point so I couldn't see him and he was watching me and he saw me go into the water and he got to me when I was about chest deep and rescued me and he said still remember what he said. I was really shivering all over. I couldn't really think straight. All I was really thinking is, okay, it didn't work this time. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll do it again. And he just said, the only choice you have right now is what counselor I'm taking you to. I'd never been to therapy. And so then I, I went to therapy. And after about a year, I realized I really want to be here. I really love it here. I'm going to be in that other place again. This is a, this life is a gift that is a short time, we're here, and I want to live it. Anasuya, how did you find the strength to decide to, to be here, and then what did you do to, to deal with the chronic physical pain after the head injury? Yeah, well, Will, it's, it's an amazing journey that so many years later now, I can only say that it's been the last three or four years that I haven't thought on a regular basis this is too hard because of the pain. But the, the pain has eased up. 
suicidal feelings have been with you all during the the process? There have been, yeah, there have been, yeah, there have been two or three times uh, during the past twenty years where the pain has been unrelenting and so strong. I get swelling in my brain and the pressure and the pain on the nerves and it just it gets so intense that the only way I can live with it is to be in that other world most of the time and then pretty soon that other world becomes a so much more real than this one and even though I love this one I think the only way to really survive the only way to really make it is to <laughs> to ditch that body but I, I oh my gosh I'm so glad I have never done that I love my life I love my boys who are grown now I love being able to help other people who are going through really hard times what are some of the things that you do to deal with the chronic pain and, and what role has your spirituality played in helping you sur- survive the pain and, and survive this ordeal I think the fact that I was a lifelong searcher of of what I call going home, going going home to my the core of my being has really allowed me to deal with the kind of physical pain that I've had to deal with. And also at the same time, that unrelenting physical pain has been like a teacher. It's it's like <laughs> my imagination, because I've never had this experience in reality, but my imagination of a very wise and dispassionate Zen master who stands over you while you're meditating and if you lose your sense of presence he whacks you with a stick and the pain wakes you up and so the pain has also been like that for me I have not been able to afford losing my focus on being bigger than my body because the only way to deal with the pain is to be bigger than the pain which required me to be aware of the fact that I'm an energy field with a very small body in the middle of it. How do you do that? Do you focus your mind? Is it a meditation practice? And I also know that this um, is part of also your work with clients because you work with a lot of clients who have chronic pain issues. I found that it's different for everybody what works. Um, There's been a practice that I learned from Dhani Oahu Uh, and just over the years have sort of made it my own. I'm sure I've changed it from how I originally learned it, but it's a medicine wheel practice, and the medicine wheel has been a huge help to me. Basically, it's the four directions, northeast, southwest, but there's lots and lots of little directions in between each of those, like you would have minutes on a clock. And there's a, a very simple practice of noting where you are on the medicine wheel. And what's so valuable to me about that is it always goes sunwise, which is like clockwise. So if you're in the east, then next you're going to be in the south. And if you're in the south, next you're going to be in the west. And if you're in the west, then you go to the north. And each direction has certain properties, emotional properties, physical properties that affect us in our life. Now, I've been tracking myself through this practice for 30 years now and I've always found it to be really accurate. So I do do this with clients. Um, one of the, the big teachings of the medicine wheel is that it's a cycle, it's a wheel. And so north is emptiness and it's a place where you plant seeds of good intention but it's not time for them to sprout yet. It's like the dead of winter. They lie sleeping under the ground. So when we're in the north we're not in what we might call a very productive place. We're in a deep reflective place. And if we try to do a lot of outward activity when we're in the north, it's going to be very difficult and we might even feel unwell emotionally or physically. And then in the east, um, it's the sunrise. It's the time of new beginnings. It's the springtime. And so those frozen waters, those stilled emotions, those stilled tendencies that were in the north. Now the rising sun melts them and they turn into rivers and they feed that seed of good intention and it starts to sprout. So this is the place of new ideas and new directions, new beginnings. And then from there you go to the south, which is the summertime. And those seeds have grown to maturity and they're bearing fruit. It's the harvest time. It's the abundant time. So if you're 
living in a place uh, emotionally, internally, where you're in the South, you're going to be probably very busy feeding other people, nourishing the world. And if you try to be quiet and inward during this time, it won't work so well. And then from there, the wisdom of the earth says, then you have to go to the west, which is the sunset. And this is the end of the cycle where you have to let go what's no longer feeding you. Like after the harvest, those old moldy corn stalks, you just have to put them back in the earth so they can recycle and, and transform. So we let go of whatever isn't serving us anymore and ask that it be transformed into something that's useful for everyone. And then we're empty and we're back in the north. So working with that has allowed me to nurture the different aspects of myself and notice which direction I'm in in any given moment and honor that. You've also described your, your work with yourself and also with your clients as bringing together multiple worlds. And I definitely hear that in the incredible stories that you're telling us today. Tell us a little bit more about that. How, especially the your training in process-oriented psychology, how does that help you to bring people into a place where they can navigate multiple worlds? Process-oriented psychology has been so helpful in that. One of the things I really love, it was so good for me, even after years and years of working in indigenous trainings where I was familiar with multiple levels of reality, there wasn't an easy way to talk about it. And um, so Arnie Mandel is just brilliant the way he talks about the consensus reality is what we have consented to call real and then the dreaming is the place that shape shifts. It's always changing our emotions, our body symptoms, our relationships, the weather. And then the essence or the ground of being the dream time where everything else comes up out of there. It's like the pregnant void that somehow that non-dual spiritual place that I go to in the light is like the pregnant void. Yes, it's the nothing. It's also the everything because everything comes out of there. And so I think about the multiple worlds, it's like we think or our brain thinks that our thinking process is who we are. We get so identified with our thoughts that we forget that our brain is not the center of the universe. Actually, there's multiple ways of perceiving and making sense of our world. So our nervous system is really good at perceiving and reacting and nerve endings run all through our body. They pick up sensations and impulses that are on the inside of us, like if we notice we have a tight muscle or we have a bellyache, and they also pick up sensations on the outside, so somebody touches our belly with their finger, we feel that too. And if you go out for a walk and the wind is blowing, your nerves can feel that. Even if it's through your clothes, you feel the subtle pressure from the wind. If it's a strong wind, say we want to be walking east, and if the strong wind is blowing west, we may have to struggle against the direction of the wind in order to stay with our agenda of heading east. And so that image, you can think of that image and, and think of your thoughts as thoughts take us in a certain direction. They're like an internal wind or an internal current mm. from our brain. And our thoughts are often blowing us in a certain direction. And yet there's a deeper and seemingly subtler current that may be happening at the same time. Just like if you look at a river and you know it's flowing downhill, so the current goes downhill, but actually the wind is blowing uphill. And so on the surface, the river might look, you know, it might have little waves or ripples that might look like it's actually flowing a different direction on the surface than it really is underneath. So actually there's multiple currents flowing in many different directions at any given time throughout the atmosphere, the earth itself, our bodies. There's fields of energy all around that are going in multiple different directions at once. And so we're constantly choosing, consciously or unconsciously, which current to follow or which flow to give into. So my meditation training, my indigenous training with Dahani, my process work training, it all really, what I get out of it, I guess the message I need the most is being open to multiple worlds, multiple directions. And shall I give you a practical example of how that might look? Yeah, that would be great. Okay, so I'm just thinking, let's say I'm cleaning my house and I'm straightening up and putting items back where they belong and I pick up something in the living room, my sweater that belongs in the bedroom and I begin to walk down the hallway toward the bedroom to put it away 
because the wind of my thoughts is blowing me in that direction. I'm thinking to myself, time to put the sweater back in my closet where it belongs, and so my body follows the direction of those thoughts and goes toward the bedroom. But if I'm open to noticing other currents, if I'm sensitive to what it feels like to be in my body or what sounds I notice or what catches my attention, perhaps on the way to the bedroom, my body is spontaneously pulled in another direction. I have an urge to turn around and go back toward the living room. And if I'm interested in following that change in direction, I might find myself drifting toward the living room again and moving toward the window. And maybe I keep flowing with that current and I end up standing right at the window in the living room looking out. This happened to me the other day. So I, I was there just in time to see a bald eagle glide right by outside the window. What a gift. I've never seen a bald eagle go through my backyard. Maybe the eagle's path was picked up by some deeper part of me, and that's why I felt drawn to the window just in time. Or maybe our paths needed to intersect for a moment, and the eagle was a messenger with something important to tell me, or a long-forgotten friend saying hi. And maybe the eagle called out to me, and some part of me under my conscious mind picked that up. and. I would have missed it all if I insisted on following my thoughts only. After seeing the eagle, I could then go and hang up my sweater, and it really didn't disrupt my agenda for more than two minutes, but it added so much to my day, so much to the rest of my day. And so, you know, sometimes when we're in chronic pain, that's a less enjoyable way to be in two states. But the example I just gave with the eagle is, you can flip quickly back and forth between one state and the other without getting completely lost in either one. You can still have a little awareness of both. Or in chronic pain, my experience when it's the pain's really intense is I feel like there's a dark curtain between me and everything else because so much of my attention is focused on trying to manage that pain, trying to function in spite of the pain, trying to relax, trying not to get caught up in my thoughts of fear that come up, you know, what if it gets worse? What if it doesn't go away and I can't sleep tonight? Will I have to cancel my day tomorrow? What, will this ever end? How can I deal? Whatever, you know, all those fears that just start spinning faster and faster. So if you feel like you're in pain to the point where you can't do your day, then you either don't do your day or you let a part of yourself split up and split off and go to another world so for me it's very helpful to go outside and look at the sky if we have a clear sky with stars or a moon or a sun or clouds i i imagine that yes here i am in this body with all this pain and also i have an energetic body i have a perception that goes beyond my skin I can see the moon. Well, can I be big enough so that I'm aware of the whole backyard? Yes. Can I be big enough so that I can hear sounds that come beyond my backyard? Yes. Can I be big enough so that I let the moon right into my heart and I merge with the moon? Yes. If I can do that, suddenly the pain becomes very tiny because I'm so big. And then I can carry the pain around, and I can carry the moon around. And if somebody talks to me, I can probably answer them. And I see we don't have a lot of time left, but tell us a little bit about how you work with people in your practice to help them get in touch with uh, multiple worlds in the way that you're describing. From process work, I've learned to follow the individual's process. So it's different with everyone. I pick up clues of what's wanting to come to the surface and be more known what might be still subconsciously known but not consciously known and we work that way to help that come up but practically speaking I have never found anyone who can't benefit from the medicine wheel and in process work there's some exercises that use those vectors that are present in the medicine wheel so I can help someone find the direction of their their most well self and walk that direction and get some insight about how to be more well in the moment. There might be an ally there that can help. An ally in the form of uh, an imaginary creature or a spirit being or a place on the earth which, a place in nature which feels really healing or 
even a movie star that seems to know how to do this one thing you don't know how to do, there might be an ally who can give you advice, who you can call on whenever you want. Or you might know that the direction that you're going when we work together on the medicine wheel is the north, and that's an inward place, and you're trying to live as though you were in the south, and how to transition from the north to the south if you really have to be in the south, but then how to go quickly back to the north if that's the place where you're really being most nurtured. So I really think that it's easy for people to do these things that I do in each in their own way, and having a guide can really help open up those channels. And Asuya, how do people get in touch with you if they want to find out more about your, um, your work? And also take a look at some of your art, because you're also a really extraordinary visual artist. Thank you. I have a website, and my art, some of my art is on there. It's www.anasuyastarbear.com. That's my name, and it's spelled A-N-U-S-U-Y-A-S-T-A-R-B-E-A-R. Oh, you can email me through the website. You could give me a call at 503-761-1520. Anna Suya Starbear, thank you for joining us today on Madness Radio. Thank you, Will. It's been wonderful talking with you. You've been listening to an interview with Anna Suya Starbear. She's a therapist in private practice and also a leadership coach with degrees in process-oriented psychology and conflict communication. She's a longtime practitioner of Cherokee Indian mindfulness practices, a survivor of head injury and a voice hearer, and also someone who lives with chronic pain and experiences altered and extreme states. That's all the time we have on Madness Radio. Thanks for tuning in. You've been listening to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Madness Radio is co-sponsored by peer-run support communities, Freedom Center, The Icarus Project, and Portland Hearing Voices. Hosted by Will Hall, music producer is John Rice, with technical assistance from Jeremy Lansman. Listen to our internet stream, podcasts, and show archives at madnessradio.net. Madness Radio can be heard on FM stations on the Pacifica Radio Network, including KBOO in Oregon, WXOJ and WBCR in Massachusetts, Alaska's KWMD, and WPRR in Michigan. If you have an idea for a story or guest on Madness Radio, to help get us broadcast on a station near you, or if you just want to share what's in your head, contact radio at madnessradio.net.